My name is Dr. Jason Helfen, and for more than a decade, I've owned and operated a unique business called the Technological Angler. The primary goal of everything that the Technological Angler does is to help anglers just like you to learn to leverage the power of their hummingbird electronics to find and catch more fish. Now, perhaps your favorite sonar tool is a classic down-looking technique, like traditional 2D sonar, like you see here on top. Or perhaps it's down imaging, which is shown here on the bottom, a technique that shares some similarities with 2D sonar, but also has some important differences. Or maybe you rely on the power of side imaging on your trips to cover a large swath of water that's off to the sides of the boat. Or maybe you leverage a truly modern technique like Humminbird's mega live imaging to track your lure and observe fish behavior and strikes all in real time. Now, whichever tool is most important to the way that you fish, perhaps the most critical question you may ask yourself as you stare at your Humminbird electronics screen while in search mode, well, that question will probably be the same. Is that a fish? Is an object or a group of objects that you see on your Humminbird electronics one of the fish you're trying to catch, or is it something else? Well, in today's seminar, I hope to give you the tools you need to conclusively identify fish using your electronics, no matter which sonar technique you use as you do battle with our finned adversaries. Let's get started. Our first stop is kind of where it all began for the marine electronics industry and for most of us as anglers, and that's with traditional down-looking 2D sonar. Of all the tools we have in our arsenal, traditional 2D sonar is the only technique that displays fish returns as arches. And you can see a bunch of those arches scattered around this 2D sonar image. Now, while these returns pretty much show the classic arch shape, it's important to recognize that the actual shape of the fish return you'll see on your electronics is highly dependent on things like your boat speed, the sonar frequency you're using, the way that the transducer is positioned in the water, and more. But arches, or at least arch-like returns, are what we can expect in 2D sonar. One of the reasons that 2D sonar displays fish as arch-shaped returns has to do with the 2D sonar beam shape. You see, 2D sonar is the only technique that is broadcast into the water with a cone-shaped beam. This cone is narrow at the top and gets wider as it travels through the water column. As a result, fish can spend an extended period of time in that beam, but as they move from one edge of the cone to the other, the distance from the fish to the transducer changes. And those changes are why the fish's sonar return is displayed as an arch. As this animation shows, when the fish first enters the cone, the distance from the fish's body to the transducer is long, certainly longer than it is when the fish is in the center of the beam. As a result, the initial part of the arch is pointing down, reflecting the long distance from the transducer to the fish. As the fish moves to the center of the beam, its distance to the transducer at the surface reaches its minimum value. So, the very top of the arch represents the true depth of the fish. As the fish passes out the other edge of the cone-shaped beam, its distance to the transducer once again reaches its maximum value. So the final part of the arch also points down. In 2D sonar, we typically associate arch-shaped returns that are suspended off the bottom with the presence of fish. But as I said before, the actual shape of the return depends on a wide range of factors. For example, at high boat speeds, when fish won't spend much time at all in the 2D sonar beam, the arch will become quite compressed from side to side, and typically appears not as an arch at all, but instead as a vertical line. On the other hand, at slow boat speeds, the fish spends a really long time in the beam, so the arch gets stretched out 
sometimes all the way out to a horizontal or nearly horizontal line. The 2D sonar beam's width, described as the beam's cone angle, also strongly influences the appearance of the fish's sonar return. With a large cone angle, typically associated with lower sonar frequencies like we see here on the left, the beam can be quite wide, so that fish spend a really long time in the beam. This tends to provide the cleanest, most intense arch-shaped returns, but can also make small fish appear like larger fish because they're spending so much time in the beam. Complicating the issue with wide sonar beams is that they also tend to have lower resolution or target separation, so that multiple small fish that are close together in the water can start to look like a single, much larger fish. Arches are sometimes less clean with a narrow 2D sonar beam, like those associated with higher sonar frequencies, such as the old benchmark 2D sonar frequency of 200 kHz, shown here on the right. However, a narrow, higher frequency beam provides the advantage of higher resolution or target separation, so a group of smaller fish are more likely to show up as a group of weak 2D sonar returns, rather than one much more intense return. Let's turn our attention now to down imaging, another down-looking sonar technique, but one that uses a beam with a different frequency and a different shape, such that fish in down imaging will look very different from fish in 2D sonar. Unlike 2D sonar, which uses a relatively low frequency cone-shaped beam, down imaging uses a much higher frequency beam that is broadcast with a shape that is wide from side to side, but very narrow from front to back. The result of using a higher frequency thin beam is that down imaging provides picture-like images of structure and the bottom, images that are very easy to interpret and understand. For example, in this down image, it is easy to identify the objects scattered on the bottom as artificial fish cribs built from logs. We can also see the edge of a rock pile on the bottom, and even a transition from bright, hard bottom on the left to darker, softer bottom on the right. The very thin down imaging beam means that fish spend very little time in that beam, and the distance from the fish to the transducer doesn't change hardly at all as it moves through the down imaging beam. So, in down imaging, fish don't provide arch-shaped returns. Instead, they appear as individual bright spots, like we see in this screen capture. Even at this very slow boat speed, the fish near the bottom are providing nice arch-shaped returns in 2D sonar. Yet those same fish are showing up as individual bright spots in down imaging. Depending on the frequencies being used, the down imaging beam may be wider than the 2D sonar beam. So it's not uncommon to see more fish in the down imaging view than you see in the 2D sonar view. And I think we're seeing that in this screen capture. Because the down imaging beam is so thin, the size and intensity, or brightness, of a fish's down imaging return can provide reasonably reliable information regarding the size of that fish. In this screen capture, we see a down imaging view of a deep weed edge with some scraggly, low-growing weeds on the right half of the view. Notice the large number of small, relatively weak or dim down imaging returns holding above the weeds. These are probably a school of small panfish or minnows hanging out over the weeds. Notice also the much larger predator fish lurking nearby. This fish has a much larger and brighter down imaging return, both of which are consistent with the presence of a much larger fish. The high resolution of the down imaging beam makes it a good tool for counting the number of fish in a school. In this screen capture, we see a couple of individual isolated fish on the right side of the view, and those fish are quite obvious in both 2D sonar and down imaging. 
Now consider the large collection of 2D sonar returns in the middle of the view. In 2D sonar, this looks like it might be a piece of structure, like maybe a brush pile or a clump of weeds, with a couple of fish hanging around it. In down imaging, however, it is apparent that this cluster of returns is actually a tightly packed school with a significant number of fish, easily a dozen or more, hanging around a single isolated rock near the base of the drop-off. The thin, high-frequency down imaging beam is also an excellent way to find fish that are holding close to, or even hiding within, structure. Here's an example of a weed bed in which the individual weed stalks are quite apparent in the high resolution down imaging view. Toward the edge of the weeds, we also see a number of individual, bright, down imaging returns. These are fish that are hiding in the weeds, close to the edge of the weed bed. Because the fish are lower in the water column than the tops of the weeds, it would be very hard to see these fish with 2D sonar but down imaging makes it easy to see them. Here's a screen capture that really reveals the power of down imaging. If we start on the top with the 2D sonar view, we see, well, we see a mess. It looks like perhaps there's a rock on the bottom with a large number of returns above and off to the side of it, but that's the best we can do with the low resolution information provided by 2D sonar. If we look at these same objects with down imaging, however, it is obvious that what we're looking at is a downed tree laying on the bottom with a large number of individual fish holding in and near the tree. Finding something like this with down imaging and conclusively identifying it as a tree is certainly waypoint worthy and could be the beginning of a great summer fish fry. Before we leave the down imaging discussion, I wanted to show you an example of how down imaging can show us some things that are not a fish. If we again start on the top with 2D sonar, we see three or four arch-like returns that almost scream walleyes. They're collected right at a subtle pivot point where hard bottom coming in from the right meets softer bottom on the left. I don't know a lot of walleye anglers that wouldn't throw right at those targets and expect to get bit in short order. But here's the catch. The down imaging view demonstrates that those arch-shaped returns, which we've learned to associate with fish from 2D sonar, aren't fish at all, but instead a perfectly placed branch. That branch provides a collection of tightly packed arches in 2D sonar that definitely look fish-like but down imaging proves that there's no fish in the vicinity. Here, down imaging is both a mystery solver and a snag saver. Let's turn our attention now to side imaging, and in particular, Humminbird's mega side imaging, which is possibly the most important sonar tool in my entire arsenal. Whether I'm breaking down a new body of water at an unfamiliar time, or visiting one of my favorite hotspots for an after work adventure, I rely on side imaging to help me quickly find the fish I'm trying to catch. Side imaging leverages not one, but two high frequency, high resolution sonar beams that are not directed straight down, but instead off to the sides of the boat. The result is a wide, information rich side imaging view that can stretch as far as 400 feet to either side of the boat. Although in practice, you'll find a side imaging range of 100 to 150 feet on either side of the boat to be more effective and useful. Because we're using a thin, high frequency mega imaging beam, you can expect easy to interpret picture-like images in your mega side imaging view. When it comes to identifying fish with side imaging, we're really looking for two things. First, a bright spot, similar to what we saw in down imaging, which we'll call the primary sonar return. This bright spot is the fish. Under most circumstances, we'll also see a dark spot off to the side of the fish, opposite the center line of the side imaging view. 
This dark spot is the fish's sonar shadow, and it is quite literally a portion of the bottom that wasn't hit by the mega side imaging beam because it was blocked by the fish's body. When we see a bright spot and a dark spot together, if there is any separation between the two at all, then we are guaranteed 100% of the time to be looking at a fish. Here, in this zoom box, we see five dark sonar shadows and four bright spots. I would tally this as a school of five fish, even though the fifth bright spot is not super obvious. And based on what we are catching at the time, I'd strongly suspect that this is a little wolf pack of fall walleyes. Here's another mega side imaging screen capture that shows a bunch of cold water walleyes on the prowl. To the left of the center line, you should see one fish, a bright spot with an associated dark sonar shadow. On the right side, however, you should see a large number of fish, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or so, starting at 40 feet off to the right and extending to the edge of the current side imaging range of 80 feet. When you hear people talking about hunting down fish with side imaging, this is what they're looking for. Large collections of bright primary sonar returns with dark sonar shadows. And just like down imaging, the brighter the return and the darker the shadow, the bigger the fish. Like this Green Bay Dirty 30. One useful function of the sonar shadow is to help give you an idea of how close the fish is to the bottom. Look at the distance between the bright primary sonar return and the dark sonar shadow. If there is very little distance between these two, then the fish is close to the bottom. And as that distance increases, the fish will be moving higher and higher in the water column. Here's an example of a bunch of fish that are closely oriented to the bottom, with very small distances between their bright spots and their dark sonar shadows. This is what we see any time we're chasing predator fish in current. Those fish will be close to the bottom, where the force of the current is reduced. These fish happen to be spring walleyes in the famous Fox River that empties into the Bay of Green Bay. Here's an example of a large number of fish that are suspended really throughout the entire water column. When that happens, you can expect to see a large distance between the fish's primary sonar return and its dark sonar shadow. Let's consider this big fish that is just off to the left side of the boat. Based on the position of that bright spot compared to the range scale, I'd guess that that fish is about 12 feet deep in about 24 feet of water, or about halfway down. Now look for its shadow. It's a long ways away. Its shadow is the biggest, darkest shadow that we see off to the fish's left. A big separation between the bright sonar return and the dark sonar shadow means that this fish is suspended high in the water column, just like many of its neighbors. Typically, when hunting for fish, we're looking for a bright primary sonar return and a dark sonar shadow. But sometimes, we might only see one or the other. Over hard bottom, for example, it can sometimes be difficult to see the primary sonar return. That's because the bright return from the fish gets masked by the very bright bottom, which is typical of hard substrates like sand, gravel, or rock. Under those circumstances, we have to rely on seeing the shadows to help us locate fish. What you're seeing here is a loose school of smallmouth bass with some walleyes mixed in, roaming a mid-depth, hard bottom flat. Now, you can see a few bright spots with their associated dark sonar shadows, but in reality, we see a lot more shadows than we see bright spots. So, if you're fishing over hard bottom, and it starts looking like someone sprinkled pepper all over your side imaging view, well, you found the fish. Let me show you a few more examples of important ways to find fish with side imaging. One way is to use side imaging to find spawning beds or colonies. In this screen capture, we see a large bluegill spawning colony. The honeycomb-like appearance of the individual nests that have been fanned out by the male bluegills is just classic. 
I use site imaging not simply to locate these colonies, but to locate colonies that actually still have fish on them. Don't just look for the beds. Look for the fish that are on the beds. Here, you'll see those bright white spots from the bluegills on beds both on the left and the right side of the boat. When you see this, it's go time. Of course, bluegills aren't the only fish that build beds. So do bass. Here's a collection of smallmouth bass beds off to the left side of the boat. Each bed is significantly larger than a bluegill bed, and the beds are well separated from each other. This is the classic appearance for smallmouth beds. Note that several of these beds have a single bright white spot on them, and you know who that is. Side imaging is a powerful way to sneak up on these fish, especially when water or light conditions prevent you from effectively finding or fishing these bedding fish with just your eyes. Here's an example of what it looks like when a large number of fish are associated with a primary piece of cover, in this case, a submerged tree. As you look between the tree and the center line, you'll see a large number of primary sonar returns. And as you look farther off to the right, you'll start to see all of those fish's dark sonar shadows. Big numbers of suspended fish near woody cover? You know what that recipe is. Crappies, and lots of them. I love chasing crappies. And here's an example of what a large school of crappies looks like near shallow weeds. On the left side of this image, we see a large weed bed in shallow water five feet deep or less in most areas. Look right at the edge of those weeds. You should see a nice school of bright white spots, mostly crappies, cruising right along that weed edge. Now look off to the right side of the boat. Do you think all of the crappies are on that weed line? Far from it. There must be hundreds of crappies over there to the right, and you can see both their bright spots and their dark sonar shadows. Okay, one last example before we leave side imaging, because using side imaging is a great way to fish dock bass. Use side imaging to look under docks, eliminating the docks that are fishless, so you can focus your efforts on those docks that are actually holding bass. Here's an example of one L-shaped dock on the left. The bright white lines are pieces of the dock's aluminum framing, and the long dark lines that run off to the left are the dark sonar shadows from the dock posts. Look under that deepest section of the dock. Do you see a couple of bright spots with dark sonar shadows? Well, I sure do, and this largemouth was one of them. Let's turn our attention now to Mega 360 Imaging. Think about 360 Imaging as being a technique that is very similar to side imaging, but one that makes use of a rotating transducer to shine those high-frequency, high-resolution side imaging beams all around the boat in a 360-degree circle. Now, I don't have to limit myself to just looking off to the left and to the right. I can use Mega 360 Imaging to look in front of, or behind the boat, or really in any direction, and enjoy the same type of picture-like images that I'm used to with side imaging. When we use 360 Imaging to spot fish, we're looking for the same things we were looking for when we were using side imaging. A bright primary sonar return from the fish, as well as a dark sonar shadow. In 360 Imaging, the sonar shadow will always be on the far side of the fish, further away from the boat. As before, if there is any separation at all between the bright spot and the dark sonar shadow, then you know you're looking at a fish. But we also have one more wrinkle when it comes to fish with 360 imaging. Because those pesky things are always swimming around, the fish returns and their shadows will move from one rotation of the beam to the next. Now here's a great example of a mega 360 imaging view with the beam rotating around in a clockwise direction that allows us to track the movement of a fish from one rotation of the beam to the next. 
Now look here as the beam rotates from left to right. We see just above the center, a real dark sonar return with a small bright white line in front of it. Now that's a fish. Watch what happens to that fish from one rotation of the beam to the next. It clearly moves. It moves from right to left. Now I've zoomed in on that fish. You can see that it has a long body with a forked tail. This is a northern pike that's coming in to inspect the transducer. Here we see the pike kind of at the 10 or 11 o'clock position and from one rotation of the beam to the next, the pike obviously moves. It's sort of eyeing up the transducer. I thought for sure it was gonna eat it. Now, as the beam continues to rotate around, of course, the fish continues to swim. Here it is starting to swim away from the transducer and that's a great example of how you can use 360 imaging to track the movement of a fish. Now we can use Mega 360 imaging to look around the entire circle in 360 degrees, or we can use 360 imaging to look at just a portion of the circle, and that's what I'm showing you here. So what we're looking at is a collection of mostly yellow perch that are kind of milling around some low growing weeds in shallow water, right? The individual fish are the bright white spots, and you can see many of their dark sonar shadows. Now watch what appears here on this next sweep, and so what we're going to see is a much brighter return with a much larger, darker sonar shadow emerge from those weeds, still with a bunch of other perch just sort of swimming around. Now as the beam continues to sweep back and forth, we see those fish on the move. Remember, those pesky critters are swimming all the time. And here I thought that that larger fish was going to eat the smaller one, but it turns out it was just a foot race. And so this is another example of how we can use Humminbird's Mega 360 imaging to locate fish, and in this case, find the direction that those fish are actually moving. Now we turn our attention to live sonar, or Humminbird's Mega Live Imaging. Mega Live is unique in that it provides real-time live sonar information so we can track our lure, see fish swimming around, and ultimately close in for the kill and earn a free trip to the boat. Mega Live is a flexible tool that can be tailored to our specific fishing situation and is something I've come to rely on heavily to catch more and bigger fish, just like this one. By adjusting the position and orientation of the Mega Live transducer, we can obtain live sonar information in forward mode, which is great for casting and retrieving, or in down mode, which is a vertical jigger's dream, or in landscape mode, which gives us a unique 140 degree wide window into the underwater world, where we can see structure and the fish swimming around it all in real time. We'll start with Mega Live in forward mode, and before I show you any fish or fish catches, I want to show you what you can expect in terms of Mega Live range in forward mode. Now here I have my forward range set to 80 feet, and the first thing that you're going to see is a sonar return at about 70 feet. Now that's my lure hitting the water 70 feet away from the boat. Now this lure is a chatterbait, and I'm just going to retrieve that chatterbait slowly just above the bottom, and as long as I keep the bait in within that mega live beam, which is about 20 degrees wide or so, then we should be able to follow that lure all the way back to the boat. So you saw it hit the water 70 plus feet away, you saw me retrieve that bait all the way back to the boat. That's what we can expect with mega live, being able to see objects that are either our lure or structure or fish at least 70 feet away from the boat and frequently much farther away than that. Now in this next forward clip, I'm gonna show you an example of pitching a real lightweight jig and plastic to a weed edge. You can see the edge of these weeds at about 50 feet away from the boat. They're at the 50 foot forward range marker. Uh, the boat's in about eight, eight, nine feet of water and the weeds are coming up to within about two feet of the surface. So there's my jig impacting the water just by the weeds, and you can see as it starts to fall down towards the edge, it starts attracting a lot of attention. I'm pulling some fish right off of that weed edge. Eventually, that one's gonna bite and earn a free trip to the boat. So this is a walleye, ended up being a walleye, that I pulled off of that weed edge. And the benefit here of Mega Live is that we're not only seeing 
the lure as it's working its way through the water, but we're seeing the reaction of the fish, right? Before that lure impacted the, uh, the surface, we didn't see a lot of fish activity outside of that weed edge. We see one or two of them here, but really not a lot happening. It was really the presence of that lure outside of the weed edge that pulled the walleyes out of the weeds, eventually getting one of them to strike. Now, I know I mentioned before how much I love catching crappies. Here I'm going to show you a mega live image in forward mode again, looking at some deeper water crappies that are associated with an artificial fish crib as the water starts to cool down in the fall. So this is about 18 feet of water. The crib is coming three, four feet off the bottom, and above that crib swimming around, you'll see a bunch of crappies. So as we see here, my jig just entered the water at about 30, 32, 34 feet away. Now that's just a 1 ounce jig with a little two inch uh, plastic minnow profile on it. Uh, you know, so obviously something that's very small, we have no trouble seeing even that very small bait with mega live imaging. We can see all the fish starting to respond to that bait. I'm just keeping it above their heads to try to draw them out of the group. There one of them just goes bonkers, decides to kill it, and he gets a free trip to the boat as well. And so just another example of how powerful mega live imaging can be in forward mode to see, uh, to see your lure, to see fish interacting with the lure and fish attacking the lure. A fantastic tool for any type of fishing, whether you fish bass, panfish, walleye, or really anything in shallow or deep water, mega live in forward mode is a great way to track your lure and see the strike. Now we can adjust that mega live transducer and have it be directed down beneath the boat. Now this is, as I said before, mega live and down mode is a fantastic tool for any sort of vertical jigging application. Here I'm uh, jigging a, a rappel, a jigging wrap, number seven jigging wrap to some uh, inland stocked rainbow trout. So there's a trout that's real high in the water column, about 10 feet down. I thought I'd be able to get him interested, but wasn't really able to. So now we're going to drop that lure back. We can see another trout sort of emerging from the deeper water. So I immediately get down to that trout, start kind of popping around, see that he's interested, see that he's, you know, going to pursue that lure, but maybe he doesn't want it moving so fast, but instead just that kind of slow lift finally gets that trout to commit. And so here that rainbow is earning another free trip up to the boat. Here's another mega live clip in down looking mode. And here I'm not gonna show you any catches, but what I am gonna show you is just a whole pile of fish that are using some fallen timber here, kind of in the early part of the season. So uh, this down viewing mode is really a great tool, not only for finding fish, but getting a feel for their mood, right? Are, they, are the fish swimming around aggressively? Are they hanging tight to cover? Do we see them? extending outside of the cover, chasing bait or chasing lures or things like that. And so we use Mega Live not only as a real-time fishing tool, but also a real-time tool for assessing fish behavior, right? This is something we can't learn about uh, unless we're actively catching a fish on a particular lure, if the fish are aggressive or not aggressive. But with Mega Live, we actually get that real-time look into the fish's world and try to understand their behavior without having to catch one. Now next, I'm gonna show you some Mega Live images captured in landscape mode. Now landscape mode, again, is giving us a 140 degree wide panoramic view of the water, the structure, and the fish that are using it. And here, we're looking at a couple of uh, artificial fish cribs, okay, those kind of square shapes in the middle of the view, as well as, you know, conservatively, hundreds of crappies that are all swimming around them. I think about landscape view uh, anytime I want to assess what's going on in my entire casting window compared to forward-looking mode, which is good when I want to look at what's going on in my casting lane. So I get a much broader perspective when I use Mega Live here in landscape mode. Next, I show you a Mega Live landscape image of kind of a featureless uh, flat, but really the key feature on this flat is that it's holding lots of fish. Look for the bright white spots, right? Just like in side imaging or down imaging, those are the primary fish returns. And the fact that those bright white spots are moving, 
right? The moving bright white spots here are the fish that we're trying to catch. And because we know what direction the mega live beam is pointing, we can see it up there associate with the boat with the boat icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. It makes it easy for us to aim our casts at the precise fish that we want to catch. Well, and here's one more mega live landscape view that shows, you know, basically a featureless flat, um, but with lots of fish. Again, we're looking for those bright white returns. We see a bunch of them scattered all over the, all over the flat. And we can see also as those fish move around, we can not only see the bright white sonar returns, but we can see their sonar shadows as they swim around the flat. Now, because we're watching all of this live, it's easy for us to see not only where the fish are in real time, but also what direction those fish are moving as they swim around the screen. And so it's easy for us to pinpoint if we should be casting a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right of those returns, or if we wanna come right through the middle of them uh, if those fish are just kind of sitting still. So just another great example of how we can assess a very wide area. Here we're looking at almost 130 feet from side to side at the far end of my landscape range. That's my entire casting window, makes it easy for me to find productive casting targets. Well, we've certainly covered a lot of ground in this seminar as I've tried to teach you how to conclusively identify fish using a wide range of sonar techniques from classic traditional 2D sonar, we see some nice fish arches here, all the way to modern contemporary techniques like Humminbird's mega live imaging to get real time information about our lures and structure and the fish that are swimming there. I'm Dr. Jason Helf and the Technological Angler. I hope you have a great fishing season and I'll see you on the water.